Dr. Pramod Sant. He's a Vice President in Siemens Limited Mumbai office, heads the import, uh, export and export controls and customs for the South Asia region that includes India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal and Maldives. He brings more than 30 years of experience in supply chain management, procurement, logistics, import, export and foreign trade. Was awarded prestigious Dynamic Logistics Professional of the Year 2015 at MALA by Maxim India. Recently, he's awarded Doctorate in Excellence Honorary in Supply Chain Management by Confederation of International Accreditation Commission and Young Scientists University, US. Please put your hands together again for Dr. Pramod Sun. Thank you. Joining him is Mr. Rajesh Kumar Salviraj. He's a graduate in mechanical engineering and certified project management professional with over 25 years of experience with various Indian and multinational EPC companies at various project life cycle for project across oil and gas, energy and petrochemical industry. Currently, he's positioned as head of project engineering manager at Tekken for their various projects globally. Let's welcome Mr. Raj Rajesh Kumar again on stage, please. Thank you. Joining them is Mr. Sanket Gala, responsible for creating and heading the sales function for B2B customers, key accounts for Gala. Joined in the family business Gala Brush Limited in 2006, which is the third generation in the business. Let's welcome him on stage, please. Thank you. And moderating this discussion is Mr. Gaurav Sathe, the fourth generation businessman from 75 plus year old business, United Inc, involved in family business since 2007. He is of course an SPJMR alumnus and we are totally proud to say that. This 24 year old guitarist who passed engineering days listening to alternate rock music and guitar believes in differentiation and innovation as a business driver for sustainable and profit growth. Let's wait to see what these panelists bring about to reunite the world and dilute the boundaries further. All yours, Gaurav. Okay. Hi, everyone. Very good this afternoon. We've had a long day of uh, the global environment. Uh, there's obviously a lot of opportunity. I think that's a given. Uh, we've spoken about the opportunity in sales and export, import. We've spoken about trade finance. Uh, now we're going to see the ownership and the investment aspects. Uh, we have here with us three uh, experts, let's say, having experiences with foreign companies. Uh, they're all there uh, with foreign companies. Uh, Sanket is an FMB, he's FMB 10. So he, we can relate to him the most in terms of uh, having started off with an SME family company and having moved to a joint venture company. Sanket, can we start off with you and your story about how you went from a family managed business to a family uh, name in terms of uh, Gala Brushes being a family household name? All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, we've not kept the session much later in the day. Everyone looks a little tired. So, uh, I, the family uh, business is into cleaning tools. The name, erstwhile name was Gala Brush Limited. We're into mechanical cleaning tools and uh, four family members were in the business. So two from uh, my father and uncle and a cousin. It's a, I can say it's a typical family managed uh, business, family owned, family managed uh, with its own challenges. And uh, somewhere around 2006 is when we decided we want to expand. That, that was a time when we started to look for private equity in, which could infuse capital into our expansion plans. And uh, at, at about the same time is when Freudenberg, the company, the German partners, they were planning to enter India. So it was, uh, I would say it was pure timing where, you know, things fit well and uh, it, it took off from there. Right. And did they approach you or did you go out? So, uh, yes, Freudenberg approached us. So they were, they had different plans to enter India uh, via, let's say, a 100% subsidiary 
also they wanted they were looking at a distribution model and the other plan was to see if there could be an indian company who was willing to partner so with that idea they approached us and uh, for us it was uh, in, so while we were looking at private equity this was not exactly private equity but for us it became a strategic uh, investor who had who was clearly the expert in the in, in our industry a global leader and uh, who was also willing to infuse uh, capital great so we're going to come back to uh, sanket story it's it's a story that sets the stage uh, very clearly there's an opportunity there's an india story that's happening there's make in india uh, our salesman prime minister has been going all across the world selling the india brand and the world is looking at us i think there's no doubt that the world is looking at us and another one such story is there with rajesh rajesh is uh, from a 100% argentinian company rajesh can you give us your story and yeah yeah hello good evening our company i am primarily working for a company it is a techint india private limited ours is an argentinian company called techint engineering and construction who are into the uh, engineering apc business for last 70 years or so with a strong presence in latin america latin america entire latin america they had decided to set up a uh, indian office to serve their global needs in terms of engineering services so this our office was established way back in 2010 uh, with around about 150 staff and uh, the main idea was uh, for at that part of time is to focus on the engineering services which uh, could be more in an optimal way that could be done at from uh, indian indian side uh, in terms of competent technical resources and availability of huge uh, manpower resources was one of the advantages that promoted them to think of setting up this office and currently we are serving the engineering services uh, in the segments like oil and gas power mining sectors and infrastructure business that's brief about our, our company and we are cooperating with them with the argentinian companies on day to day basis great so from that we move on to dr pramod sant uh, who is from siemens uh, the the behemoth that we know siemens uh, so dr pramod can you give us the story of siemens and how they look at the various businesses that they run in in india okay so see, everybody knows that siemens is a global multinational uh, coming from germany but one something which people may not be knowing that the siemens is there for 150 years in india it started with 1867 putting a cable telegraphic cable from europe to calcutta which became operational in 1870 we are here doing the manufacturing right from 1922 we got uh, incorporated in 1957 we are listed one very few siemens companies are listed on stock exchange in germany and earlier usa but we are listed on stock exchange from 71 so we don't call ourselves as really a Uh, multinational we call it the indian company with a global heart and the proof of that is that we have closed to around 23 factories in india total 23000 people working which includes not only manufacturing but engineering services uh, software development and varieties of uh, the products which are there in addition to that something which we do is uh, in promoting the indian companies to export back to the germany uh, which is called as international procurement of operations so lot many indian companies suppliers they make the products which are going globally so looking at and few more thing is like just we have factories which make the global products so the, some products goes across the world to close to 65 countries so to that extent really we are able to promote lot many indian industries and uh, medium size and small scale companies so we have with us uh, two german companies and one argentinian company that has invested in india and is running running successful operations in india 
uh, we know that the culture across geographies is very different. Uh, whether it is to how we behave, uh, what we expect in terms of being yelled at, even that is very different. So, can you give us some anecdotes of the cultural differences with respect to the business and office environment, if any, especially with respect to reporting structures? Uh, we'll start with Rajesh, because Argentina could be a completely cultural, I mean, we're seven seas across. Yeah, right. But uh, actually, we have uh, taken to India as well. We are working, we are having engineering centers in Latin America, mainly in Mexico, and uh, we are having another engineering center at Buenos Aires. Apart from that, we are having an European engineering center at Milan. So, in terms of communication and the cultural challenges, the, uh, when we are dealing with the people in the Milan and when we are dealing with the people in the Argentina, it is totally different. Not only in terms of language barriers, apart from the language barriers, their communication, style of communication, uh, formats of communication, the expectations, it is completely different. Uh, one particular thing is, uh, in terms, in case of Argentina, it is, uh, they are more cultural, more artistic, and they are, I mean, in terms of, uh, they tend to develop a close inter interpersonal relationship. That helps to build a further communication process more easier, which doesn't happen with, uh, with the European nationals so easily. But uh, Argentina, it is totally different in that sense. Given an instance, they take care of the per your personal uh, priorities. Uh, they deal, they discuss with you more in detail about your personal, your family, your in and abouts. And then they slowly move closely and then they build their interrelationship and then take it forward for the further business communication. And also their, their uh, Argentina, the literacy rate is also quite high. It is 97, 98% literacy rate. So, uh, their style of communication, it is more formal, though we are we discussing, they try to put it on black and white, so all the communications. So, that way it is, the communication style is uh, more prominent and uh, it plays a very vital role. That's a major significant dis uh, difference, I would uh, say, in terms between communicating with uh, Argentina and uh, Milan. Apart from that, we are having the challenges like uh, the local regulations and so on, which is quite different between the two, uh, I mean, between Europe and Argentina. So Argentina more, uh, they follow the U.S. standards, U.S. principles, guidelines, more they adapt more towards that. That's one challenge is we are trying to adapt it. Uh, these are the two major things right. I would uh, say at this moment. Dr. Sant, any funny stories around the cultural mismatches? Uh, I will not call them as a funny stories, but I will call that as a learning experience. Uh, typically, the Siemens and German companies, they are very well known for their structured processes. The, everything which you will have is a standard operating process, which will be there with all this, uh, uh, along with that, every format, everything, if it is an electronic thing, it will be well structured and there will be various level of checking. Many things which is there is a, something called as 4i principle, that for everything you will have one commercial, one technical, both checking the things, each one is having clear responsibility of what is to be done. And the people who do their jobs, they are really thorough in their job. They may be handling the part which is a very small area, but they are experts. Like instead of that, we feel we are, should be more generalistic and somebody asks you a question and you feel if you are not able to answer, then something is wrong with us. It's not there. The people will tell that, okay, I don't know this, I'm not expert. And one thing I wanted to show, uh, example, which is in logistic and import-export area, we were doing one power plant in Gujarat and uh, a lot of heavy equipments were coming there and one of the, uh, so it was the first time few years back, they allowed us to put our own logistics team into place and how they trained us also, but then they came that we will send you observer so that we can guide you and we don't want to have the risk mitigation also in place. So the observer came in mid of project when this transformer was to be moved, just from port we got it right, 
but from let's say from this place we have to put it to the foundation which is near wall and he was waiting there he saw and next day he stopped the order so what is stop order is that when anybody a transport engineer looks into any area risk he gives a stop order and which cannot be challenged unless the objections are removed completely to rectify a situation and in that case we tried all the ways my assistant was sitting with him he tried to explain my group leader tried to explain him i phoned his boss in germany that he don't understand india and this is the way in india all sort of then finally i went there and he was very systematic so we sat he was having powerpoint present photographs actually not powerpoint presentation he showed one truck coming in which there was some material he said i thought it is a scrap truck scrap material but i found there were equipments inside that then another photograph of heap of equipment kept he said i requested them why don't you keep it properly uh, but something like that then there was a photograph of hydraulic jack from which the oil was leaking it was very little but he say you are spoiling the environment and once the oil goes into earth this will be permanently damaged it is very really, very really difficult it should not be done then he saw the wires with which one the pin which is put on the sides this is a common issue and then we have no choice we work two days and last point which he made was very important he said this power project has planned two years back we have selected the vendor carefully we have something called as method statements that means method statement means how this heavy equipment will be moved <coughs> is written down step by step including each equipment what will we use etc what capacity it's signed off i see i go to site at 7:30 in morning by 8 o'clock people are coming supervisor come at 9 o'clock and 9 to 9:30 or sometime 10 they discuss i don't understand what is been discussed the issue is that you have signed a paper you know what is to be done tomorrow and why are we wasting 3 hours in morning so we learned lot and it's happen in many many areas so punctuality adhering to process somehow we are always away from the process so not much cultural difference but i will call that all as a learning experience which makes you to deal when you deal with other countries much better absolutely lots to pick up attention to detail uh, being disciplined so much to pick up uh, sanket can you give us the technological side any inputs that you have got out of this uh, association in terms of technology be it by way of uh, process by engineering any inputs definitely so uh, i mean we gain a lot from this joint venture so the indian partner itself has its own strengths we were uh, we are very strong in our sales and distribution uh, we are strong with the local market knowledge and the german partners come along with uh, a very solid technological background they have a very good r and d setup uh, like uh, pramod ji mentioned the processes so i think it's there with most of the multinationals it's not people managed it's system managed so a lot of processes uh, were uh, were adopted by us i mean uh, if if i can just talk about technology simply top 3 products right now that we sell two of them have a direct influence because of the german partners so one product which is only made for the indian homes it's it's a it's our uh, humble jhadu it was designed in germany for the indian market so the the i would say the r and d uh, setup that they have we we uh, gained a lot from that if i was to rephrase this in a very uh, action oriented question that after this association you redesigned this the the, the indian jhadu exactly had it not been for this partnership what would you have done and would it have gone down a different story we been selling the jhadu for 60 years garo so it never occurred to us that we could do it differently it it just never occurred to us and it sometimes helps to see this from outside so they saw it differently and uh, and it worked we ha- we had our own doubts about this but at the end of the day it worked right uh with you has there been any uh, let's say advantages other than let's say the obvious obviously fund fund flow is one 
big part of uh, having access to international uh, multinationals or global companies. Anything other than the obvious that you would say is an advantage? The advantage, uh, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, as Pramod said that uh, ours is not into that, not into that innovation sector or something like that, we are, we are doing R&D or something like that. It is, ours is an engineering company which is uh, established technologies are there, established processes are there, established softwares are there, established uh, technical guidelines are there. It is all, the work is done according to the defined guidelines and the principles. But in terms of uh, organization and organization of the procedures, formats of reporting, it is more structured in terms of Argentinian companies rather than with any other companies uh, uh, which we have worked in the past with them. So that's uh, one key thing. But uh, in terms of uh, working functionality, functionally, technically, when we are speaking about working, uh, the way of working, their working style is more on uh, the, more based on, let's say, not, not, they don't really depend upon the latest softwares or the trends in the market. They go with their traditional approach to define everything and then move on to the bulk of work which is yet to be done from the uh, software perspective. So that's where they pass on the activities over to us and then subsequently it is developed. So the basic plans and it is all well structured and it is defined on the principles of conventional principles which is existing for years together. Whereas the other companies, the other, uh, let's say the other uh, developed countries including US or other way around, their working culture is slightly different than the Argentinian companies in this aspect. It's the only one difference uh, which we observe it, but it's not a significant limitation or it is not a big learning from that. But uh, yes, obviously the procedural part is more defined and well structured. So speaking about the procedural part, Sanket, could you give us an insight about the process that you followed? in terms of once uh, this company approached you, it doesn't mean tomorrow you are together. There's, exactly. there's a big long drawn process. Can you describe your story and give us a input on, uh, you know, what, what a company would typically go through when it comes to having a partnership with a foreign company? So, uh, what exactly happened was, when they approached us, uh, the idea was initially to distribute the German products in India. Uh, at the same time, they were asking us if we were open to any kind of a collaboration. And uh, as, as I previously mentioned, we were anyways looking at private equity. So, the family was open to this. That followed with a couple of rounds of meetings back and forth here or in Germany to finalize, you know, how a possible joint venture company could come together. At, at that time, what we as a family were looking was to see how a culture fit is there with the German company. So, we were more interested in seeing, you know, how business is developing, how decisions are taken, uh, uh, you know, what could be the challenges going ahead if we get into this uh, partnership. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it was a big decision for us. Uh, once we had an in-principle agreement of uh, forming a joint venture, then it was a plain simple, so you do the negotiations, then there's a due diligence and uh, the signing. So the first part is the, the two senior managements agree in principle on exactly. a working arrangement. Exactly. Just, I mean, if I have to simply put it, it's like how you would meet somebody if you want to marry. So you have a couple of meetings, you understand what they like, what they don't like. You imagine how it will be to live with them for a longer period of time. So it was exactly like that for us. Yes, you are right. In, in many ways, it is a sort of a marriage. Uh, it is. Uh, and you need to find the right partner. Uh, you need to be sure of whether you are able to work it through once you are in it because uh, otherwise you are comfortable on your own till then, right? Once you are together, you are together. Uh, Dr. Sant, can you give us an insight as to what Siemens looks at in terms of working with any partner, if you have any insight yeah. on that? 
so what happened is that uh, this example of marriage is uh, very ex uh, i mean really good but what we do in marriage and what could be german looking into marriage when we do look for a new company is very interesting right. uh, talk or one thing you have, when you are trying to have partner you have something around 8 to 10 verticals which come into picture so finance is one part then there is a uh, what you called as a tax is another part then you have a technology quality control ehs uh, uh, environment health and safety so these 10 verticals will have partner so let's say there will be one partner from germany one partner from siemens india and one partner from the local party they will be forming a one team which will have a leader or a coach and a final and the objective of this team is to get into the really details let's say local company will have definitely balance sheet etc study but apart from that various risk which are getting measured so what kind of people are there the hr will be into picture the people their availability then if there are import export are there any some cases or there are how the valuation is done how are the exports are there any obligation lined or in case of environmental health safety what are their policies whether they are far away or what can be done so this all forms and this be one become this documents are collected documents are shared then the risk are decided and then the things progress so maybe from marriage not only looking at the kundali but blood groups the family gen so many generations everything is looked into and discussed openly after all the initial documents are signed that ndc and other part then this is checked really in detail so which gives you comfort to both sometime it happens that the indian counterpart is not able to understand that if initial stage he has been asked so many documents so many details and sometimes it happened that for a couple of months the indian company is busy in giving this documentation so sometimes they wonder but at later date it understand that once the things are changed there will be cultural differences but when you are clear that where the other company stands and everything is fine then the next steps can be taken much better way that's what we believe sure you raise a very important point that uh transparency is very very important when it comes to partnering a company uh and especially in the indian context a lot of family companies are extremely uh, guarded with respect to sharing information and uh, the minute there's a discussion they, there may be interest the minute there's a discussion on having potential for infusion of funds but when it comes to backing that uh, with respect to a business plan with respect to a a profit uh, plan with respect to data on your customers we become extremely sensitive uh, how do you see that do you see it as a threat or what is the perspective see i can do uh, look into this two ways the number one is that there are really professional i mean even though it is a family or it is a medium size or a company if their business is really clean and everything is possible there is no issue coming at all but the way which sometimes accounts are kept sometimes how it is handled how the taxes are shown there are challenges many times and that's where there is always a doubt in the companies from abroad when they see into such type of either jv or a, a merger and another concern which comes which is a new one is the environment health and safety issues Uh, people are looking at really how this company's culture into environment protection health of and we don't look at normally only the people uh, em uh, employees unions uh, many times it happened that if you look at in germany the union people are having say in a mergers acquisition or high wow so same way they look at how you are treating your union and diversity in people Uh, how is been treated so all these points which are sometimes very soft or we take it granted but these are also looked into uh, today in much detail so uh, once a foreign company would want to take stake in a local company i am sure putting in so much money they are always interested in a majority stake such that they control the future and they control the actions would you agree with this largely this is what happened in our case so 
I remember it was the first meeting that we had in uh, Germany. Uh, right before we m have a formal meeting, we were invited for dinner. And uh, so we were, we went with the intention of having this collaboration. But on the first evening itself, it was made clear to us that uh, they were only interested in a majority stake. And if we were okay, then we can, we will proceed with the further meetings. So that, that was the night when the family got together to, un, you know, have a discussion. And we agreed in order to grow in the Indian market. I, I remember once you said, uh, if you want to be a small player and own 100%, or you want to be part of a bigger picture and, you know, maybe own, own right. a smaller the, the exact uh, pie. correlation is like having a small pastry or being a small slice of a larger cake. Exactly. So, the family was all right. The family was uh, not averse to the idea of uh, giving away majority. It, it, was, it was very uneasy for us, uh, uncomfortable, but I think we could work it out. And that's when we went ahead with the negotiations. Right. Uh, sharing a personal an anecdote, uh, I come from a family business as well. I am now the fourth generation. And we've had two such uh, incidents where we've been approached by companies as well. And these being uh, among the top 10 companies in the world. And let me tell you, when it's a, it's a very credible partner looking uh, to work with you, I think it's a matter of great uh, pride. It's a matter of great opportunity. And, and you feel like getting in, involved into at least an, a preliminary discuss, discussion on how it goes. Uh, and on both occasions, the, the deal fell apart or we weren't interested. One, for the fear of losing control. I'm sharing this very transparently and maybe I'm putting it too bluntly. Maybe it was not as simple as that. But dilution in our family context is, is almost seen as a taboo. And I think there is time now, uh, having had this whole day, talking about globalization, I think we need to start thinking at least in terms of being open to this concept that today businesses run through partnerships, through uh, people coming together and it's immaterial whether the people are from Bombay, from India, from, it, it's just about people having the right sort of backgrounds, being, having synergy and being able to work together. You could have an idea that's, that's in Bombay, the funding that comes from Amsterdam, and you could have a CEO who's from America, it doesn't really matter. But being from these family companies, I think we need to start thinking about this mindset in terms of being open to this change. Uh, the other uh, thought process was where will we get value? We may end up giving all the data and they may stop talks and end up uh, using this data and coming into India anyway. Now, here one pointer would be, and, and I think most of you would agree, that even if you were not to give this data, data today is available. You just need to pay for it at ROC, at various uh, exam portals. Data is available. I don't think we need to be so fearful if the opportunities are right, if the partners are right. And, and this can be put in process with a very uh, solid uh, ground with NDAs in place, with professional investment banking companies in place. And would you agree that when there are professional investment banking companies, the data is yeah. largely safe? I think when, uh, when the uh, companies sign this agreement of NDC or data sharing, I think they st definitely stick to that. Uh, that is what my experience. But one point which I wanted to just give, at many times, not maybe Siemens, but I have seen a lot of examples that when such JV happened or uh, the mergers happened, the original company, local company, has got one towering personality. Mm. And that towering personality become hurdle into the future of both joint venture or merger. So, and for, unless that person is ready, as you say, that he need to change and look a little more broader way. Because tomorrow it can happen that his team is coming from some other part of the world and he need to adjust and do that. Because he is the one, that fear of losing everything, uh, which is not only, even though the company has been taken or a new venture has formed, but still that towering personality affects uh, such deals You're many right. times. Doing business is not that easy. We all know it. We try to drive our businesses day in, day out. Uh, the senior management does have a role. 
uh, even post such a deal. Uh, it could be a short term role if the understanding is very clear that there's going to be a time where there's going to be a 100% acquisition. Uh, this sort of is a very uncomfortable discussion. So we leave it at that point. But uh, it could be that you know, when companies otherwise, let's, let's talk about it, companies could come in anyway. Why do they need a local partner? So Rajesh was part of the senior management when a, when a foreign company put in 100% stake, started, it, started an office in India without any acquisition. Was it hard to do so? I'm, I'm sure permissions and this. Yeah, but uh, yes, foreign companies, it is a little bit of difficult, but I don't think uh, it was a big, uh, there was any big hurdles. They do, we did not have any big hurdles because uh, they had basically our uh, senior management in uh, that point of time from Milan, they had originally, uh, they had worked and they had already established uh, an office in India for uh, some other companies. So based on that uh, experience, they have uh, located the right uh, candidates in terms of operating board of directors and so on. And based on that, they try to establish the office. The, pro the process of setting up the office was done maybe probably within a period of about six months. That's from the incorporating it, registering it, completing all the formalities, acquisition of the building, developing the infrastructure. All those things was done in six months period, which is quite uh, attractive. We did not face any much, uh, much difficulty. Right. Do you think, uh, Sanket, that had your partner come into India anyway as a competitor, would it have been difficult to compete with them? Or would you, as an Indian company with a, a past and a legacy and contacts, been able to easily overpower them? We always believe... I'll just take the mic. Yeah. So we always believed, uh, I mean, since India was growing, uh, just when we did the joint venture, before that we had three other foreign companies approach us with the same idea. So. Foreign companies were definitely looking at India and uh, we were ready to take on competition in that way. Uh, we had the conviction and belief that since we were locally homegrown with, with vast experience of the local Indian consumer, we would have eventually fought that competition. Uh, it, time would have only told us who would come, at, come on top, but we were ready to face competition even if the, the deal fell off. From these three prospects that you mentioned where the deal didn't go across, uh, did any one of them enter India anyway? And did they tie up with another competitor company or did they come in on their own? So only one of those companies finally entered India through a distribution partner. So they did not have their own subsidiary. They are right now present via distribution partner. Uh, also a reason is because the in industry is very uh, unorganized. Not not a lot of organized players exist today, so the options are far too few. Right. So I think with this said, uh, we're quite clear that there's a large global opportunity. Let's be open to these ideas. Uh, one possibility is if you plan to take and drive your business into, let's say, 100x, uh, and if you feel that you're not ready for it either because of the technological barriers, capex, it could be... Uh, I don't know, technology, uh, maybe it may be time to start looking out and start looking for one of those uh, top 10, top 20 players globally that today may not be present. And uh, that, that would be one way. And while saying so, we are all established family companies. There is also a large opportunity to go abroad and maybe work with local partners there to scale up. There's, there's a big global opportunity. Let's leave this thought at that and let's take questions for this great panel. Yeah. Can we have a mic in the audience, please? Uh, a few years back, I started a new company which was into a niche, uh, uh, into a niche business. Uh, the market size is uh, rather not very big, but uh, say a few few crores would be the market size. But it is, it is again in a niche segment. 
Now, uh, I tried quite a lot in uh, making a JV or a collaboration with uh, European companies. Uh, the, I mean, I was the one approaching them rather than they coming to me. Uh, now, the, the, this, uh, uh, they took all the data with, from me about, about the market size, how the market is and everything. Uh, the last, the most common uh, statement what they used to give me is there's a lot of rate tipism in India. The taxes uh, are pretty high as compared to Europe, the, the corporate tax that is there. Uh, and the second part is the corruption. Slightly louder. You're talking about the red tapism in India. Yeah, the red yeah, tapism. Continue. The red tapism that is the, then the corruption part and the informal economy that uh, that goes around. So uh, that's what what they were bothered about. So my question is, how can in this kind of situation, how can we approach uh, approach them and uh, how can we excite them to uh, come and form a collaboration or a JV with us? My second question is, I I uh, with the huge manufacturing experience, what uh, China has. Instead of uh, tapping the big companies, uh, what I see is their SME companies, SMEs in China, again, they have, uh, they have a lot of uh, manufacturing experience and maybe a medium-sized company in India would be a, a small-scale industry in China. I mean, their small scale would be our medium scale over here. Uh, they being all having a lot of manufacturing experience, uh, if, that, if they are able to form a JV or a collaboration or they are able to establish a branch over here in India, uh, they can do wonders in terms of uh, the kind of uh, product what they can manufacture in India. So I tried approaching a lot of uh, uh, Chinese companies also, but uh, again, uh, the major problem what they had was the language barrier because these being small companies, they don't have various departments uh, who's going to deal in finance or, you know, like a big company, they have various departments and they would be having that acumen or the caliber uh, for dealing with, uh, you know, uh, taxes or... Uh, uh, language barrier and everything. So, so we'll divide this into three parts. Into, uh, into, three, parts. into three parts. Rather so the first one about the red tapism and yeah. how you overcome that. Pramod, can you handle it? See, I can see and I can give you an example of Siemens when we recently went through uh, restructuring and what is focus really on India, which is a global people field. We made regions across the world of all the Siemens. Siemens is in more than 150 countries. We made the regions. Only four countries we kept outside the region. Germany, because we own there, US, China, and fourth is India. Because people feel that India is a market. Second is ease of doing business score in World Bank ranking. We can see the score, see the logistic index also is improved. So there are so many index which are there, uh, which is, and another most important thing is the growth at GDP, the things which are so clear figures, uh, it is possible. If you go to individual stories, then people can give you hundreds of rectism stories. But if you look at overall, I think there is a great change in my special area of customs, import, export and logistics. If you look at the growth is so fast by government that the companies are not able to match that digitization speed in customs area. I can tell you that. So don't go by what is always come as a story. You look at these rankings, look at the broader picture, you will be able to convince. Okay. And the second and third part, very quickly, we are short on time. Uh, how do you take on China? Does the JV and access to funds, technology in any way help there? And B, a language barrier. How do you overcome that? So, uh, I'll take the third part. Language barrier, because we are working with a German company, there is no language barrier as such. Uh, it's, it's English as a mode of communication. Uh, so far as China is concerned, uh, because we exist in a market where we are, we are uh, working with innovation, innovation being one of the core values of the company. So China right now is present at the, uh, let's say, lower segment of the industry. We, we don't actually see, we don't face that competition. Or we don't have that question of facing China as competition. Maybe the other two panelists can uh, probably throw some light. So I think with China, China's a threat to all of us anyway, uh, with or without the joint venture partners, we're taking them on head on. I mean, we deal with some competition as well. And I would say uh, the prices in India are much, much lower than the prices in China. 
I'm waiting to go and attack on the Chinese market. So I think that's your answer. With or without the global partnerships, we are, I'm sure we can take them out. How can we uh, get JV partners from China or do a collaboration? So, to do this basically… Not, not competing in, with them? In uh, any case, with China or otherwise, uh, to get the JV partners, there's a process as we more or less discussed. You should start scouting for partners in your business and there's two types as you see. There could be a strategic partner and there could be a direct competitor who would want to just buy you out. So, you could… Uh, in fact, you could just get into an investment banker who will take… Uh, take this as an assignment. I think that's that's it. We, that's all the time we have for. Uh, thanks for this great session. Well done. It was a great session indeed. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for moderating so well. Thank you, Dr. Pramod, uh, Dr. Raj, uh, Mr. Rajesh Kumar, uh, and Mr. Sanket for your valuable contribution. Thank you. I think when we approach a topic like this, what appears to be a, a problem is uh, the cultural fit that you touched upon initially, but clearly what's important is to have the courage to take that first step forward, and the rest will take care of itself. Thank you so much. May I please request uh, Sandeep uh, Kankaria and Mustafa Memun to come on stage and felicitate our distinguished panelists, please. And Dr. Tulsi, please join us with a picture. We were missing you here. <laughs> So from active listening, let's now progress into active interaction with Ms. Birgit Leodun on innovation and sustainability. Please welcome her on stage. Let's do it 10 times louder this time. Let's welcome her on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Um, you know what they say, saving the best for last. My friend Birgit has for years been amongst the most profile young shipping female executives globally. For the past 10 years, she has advocated the next generation, diversity, sustainability, and the need for change across global maritime industry. She's currently Director of Sustainability, Ocean Industries and Communication, in Oslo business region, an initiator of their project to realize Oslo's potential as the world's capital for ocean entrepreneurs. She also heads the business program at Oslo as European Green Capital. In September 2018, she was handpicked to interview Barack Obama for an audience of 3,000 business leaders. She has figured on a number of leadership rankings was awarded Shipping Name of the Year Norway in 2012, and was a finalist for the World's Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders 2018. Birgit, the floor is yours. Let's see. 
There we go. So trying once more. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Seemed that the headset from upstairs didn't work downstairs. So I'm Birgit. Uh, I'm kind of a shipping uh, environmentalist person. <laughs> and um, I thought I wanted to share a few uh, inspiration stories and pilot cases from Norway with you today. Uh, and then hoping to round this off in a discussion to look at um, cooperation opportunities between Norway and India, Oslo and Mumbai. So, uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, the city of Oslo, which is the capital of Norway, is working to fuel the generation cleanup in order to uh, push sustainable growth and innovation. So, I don't know what, how much you guys know about Oslo and Norway, uh, but our capital uh, are really proud of having the world's most innovative approach to become zero emission by 2030. Uh, we have a unique climate budget, actually, that is linked to the financial budgeting of our capital that all, uh, all initiatives are tracked on, and where the goal now is to cut Oslo's emission by 50% by uh, 2022, and then 95% emission cuts by uh, 2030. And I mean, 2030 is not uh, so many years from now. So I thought I'll, I'll give you some intros into how we are doing that in the transport and logistics sector, which is a sector that I think, regardless of which industry you work uh, with, uh, you still deal with transporting stuff. So, we are working towards becoming a zero emission city. And um, I come from the shipping industry myself, uh, having worked with uh, international shipping for many years. Uh, and for Oslo, I don't know the figures from Mumbai, I actually tried to look into that. Uh, but for Oslo, 63% of our local emissions come from transportation, uh, based on road, construction sites, uh, and uh, the ocean transportation in terms of ferries, uh, commercial logistics, etc. So this is a huge, huge uh, area of us to invest in when we are moving towards uh, sustainable innovation and, and creating a new, more inclusive, clean society. Um, I head up a program for the entire business community of Oslo, uh, where we are onboarding the business sector to help realizing uh, the climate goals. And we have uh, identified six core industries in Oslo, which I think would be like the same type of industries that would be relevant here in India, um, where we see that the industries are either representing massive uh, environmental problems by their operations, or they represent um, um, a kind of a, a foundation for impacting other industries. So we're looking at construction, energy, mobility, and the ocean industries as huge providers of CO2 emissions, and then we're looking at tech and finance as enablers, because if they uh, come with either new requirements for green financing, or new technology that helps us drive sustainable technology and innovation, then we're on the right track. So we, we are now basically working with these six industries, and then we are connecting those big, big players to the new generation of smart thinkers, to entrepreneurs. And we are lifting forward the key unresolved society problems that we have, challenging the young generation to use this as a business opportunity canvas, basically, where we look at problems and establish conservative industries, mix them up with new radical thinkers who can make their own new businesses um, in the kind of um, outer areas of established branches. So, we basically look at, just to be very clear on that, we, we don't just look at uh, sustainability and innovation from like the ethical perspective. We are one of the, the leading oil producing countries of the world, uh, and we have one of the world's biggest pension funds. We look at this as a strictly kind of business case based mentality. 
we see that the world is changing. We need much more energy, but we need the energy to be produced in a, and consumed in a more sustainable manner. And we see that the transition from the oil, coal, and gas economy will give us opportunities ahead if we do our work right. So we actually approach um, sustainable solutions and innovation in the same way that we address gender diversity. We look at this as business opportunities where we can create more and better financial growth and where we can really fuel the competitiveness moving forward to secure uh, future generations. So, we are working a lot. I mean, uh, I, how many of you followed the World Economic Forum and this young Swedish girl this year? Did you hear about her? This 15, now she's 16, but yeah, 15 year old student who has just been, you know, staying out of class to protest against our lack of acting on climate change. And she's really pushing us and she's saying that you guys are not doing your job. So then the young generation has to clean up for us, or after us, basically. And we have looked at how, how can we, uh, through our work in the city government and with the established businesses, how can we facilitate um, innovation and growth in a way that these kind of youth can use uh, their strong, strong commitment towards the environment combine it with innovative thinking, and how can we give them the tools to act and succeed in fixing the mess that we and the previous generations has created. So that's some of the thinking that lies behind the next projects that I'm gonna show you now. And then I've, I've basically now, for this presentation, I wanted to just, I, there's so many people talking about sustainability and innovation and very kind of broad, brush without going into the actual specific projects. So I, I thought that for this presentation I wanted to share with you some of the, of, of the very kind of clear, uh, practical projects and pilots that are coming out of Oslo now and, and showing you kind of how we are changing the city from within. So uh, our city government, they have banned private cars from the city center. They're removing all the public uh, car parking spaces. Uh, and uh, we have now, for the um, past few years, we've gone from you know, a situation where you know, um, the, the traffic jams and, and the, all the emissions coming out, making people sick and uh, increasing asthma and really creating the city into a more hostile environment. We've gone from like a, a, a curve that goes like this and now we have a curve that goes like that. So, even though, I mean, Oslo is a really, really small city uh, compared to Mumbai, of course. Uh, but it also has some good capabilities of like testing out some specific pilots that can be uh, partnered up and brought into a much bigger city or cities like Mumbai. So, one of the big changes that we've done, and, and I think that that's no, kind of news here in India, a lot of people go bicycling, you have the tuk-tuks, you have lots of like small scale mobility solutions to get from one place to another. But that actually hasn't really been the case in Norway. People have been driving everywhere. Uh, so we have now over the past years, we have uh, implemented like urban sharing systems, both for like just normal leisure transportation, but as we, uh, as we banned uh, C uh, CO2 emitting uh, vehicles from the city center, then we actually experienced that uh, big players such as DHL, they have now come up with new innovative solutions to deal with the way of transporting goods from the ports and from the big logistics centers into the city center. So this, uh, this bicycle here to the right, the yellow one is actually a, a specific innovation coming out from Oslo as an answer uh, to the new requirements from the government. Uh, and then actually, uh, whether people are delivering mail or like this cleaning up in, um, uh, in the uh, public gardens and parks, uh, they actually go by bicycle, even when it's snow. <laughs> 
And um, for families in the city of Oslo, they are now also using this kind of uh, urban uh, sharing transport bicycles uh, to move anything from their kids to stuff they're buying in the stores. So then go from the kind of micro-mobility to the big one. Uh, a huge challenge uh, still for a while is that we need diesel and, and gas for the big and heavy and energy consuming uh, uh, transport. But now you have, do you know the uh, American company Nikola? It's um, kind of the sister of Tesla. Uh, they're working on hydrogen as a fuel for uh, heavy and long transportation. And they're coming up now with their new uh, hydrogen cargo trucks. Uh, and we have now, um, ordered a big number of these actually for transportation of, uh, of farming products. So I think they're coming to Oslo now within a few couple of years. So we're actually functioning there as a kind of test bed for this American supplier of uh, hydrogen trucks. And at the same time, we get to then work with the suppliers and the producers a lot to look at kind of how it can be um, how it can be uh, adapted to kind of Norwegian needs, etc. And then we we actually have um, uh, we have a system as well uh, fueling all our buses that are not electric on biogas. Because I mean, it, it, the big installations in in uh, and getting kind of electric vehicles, it, it requires a lot of big infrastructure investments. But we do actually, in most cities, we have a lot of stuff, resources that we don't really use. So in Oslo now, um, everything that we waste in our, in our households and in corporations and in the public sector, all the food waste, it's delivered to one of these um, um, factories over here. So, and then, it's actually our food waste that is fueling all our green buses, which is quite cool. Of course, we don't want to waste food, but when we do, then at least it can work for something good. And this project has been awarded one of the top five green public transportation projects globally. And that coming from, you know, small little country like Norway and a small little city like Oslo, it's kind of, it's fun. Uh, then we have, um, we have also challenged uh, the kind of the rest of the transportation sector. So now they're coming up new companies, uh, not every month maybe, but there are now coming up a, a big group of various companies that are supplying the businesses with green transportation mode. So we have everything from green delivery vans, but we also have like autonomous drones that can replace the need for a lot of kind of small deliverables, whether it's to ships or if it's kind of uh, along the coastline. And this earlier, this uh, I think actually January, uh, we also launched a fleet of sharing cars. So of course, Uber is great for sharing mobility services, but here now we actually have uh, a pool a uh, huge pool uh, of uh, electric cars that you can find everywhere in the city. So instead of me going by my car or, or you know, uh, public transportation, wherever, I can find these cars on my map uh, and I can use it, book it, and I use it whether it's for uh, going to the office and then I just leave it there. Somebody else take care of the practical stuff. I don't have to find a parking spot. I don't have to worry about paying the meter, etc., and I don't need to bother about the maintenance. But I still get that feeling of having my own vehicle transporting me in a more flexible way than the public transportation network. Um, and then we move over to the ocean. And I've been thinking about this every time I'm in, I'm in Mumbai. It bothers me so much that this, you're always stuck in these traffic jams, right? And I've been thinking like this morning, I had to go from one place in uh, Mumbai to another. And I was like, oh, why can't I just, you know, go very quickly uh, on the sea-based part? Because I was going from one place near the sea to another place near the sea. And instead of being stuck for 90 minutes in traffic, it would have been so nice to just like whew, fast track 
over the ocean. So um, this uh, last year we had this uh, white ferry on the top here. It, it came to Oslo, and, and it's actually a zero emission ferry uh, that just transports our uh, citizens and our tourists out to the small islands off the coast of Oslo without emitting and. Yeah, people can just relax and you can't hear a sound. It's just completely silent. And then uh, in a few months, uh, our government has also done now a, um, uh, a change project so that we've had these old ferries that run on gas and diesel. And then within summer, they will be operating strictly on electric uh, energy that is also then produced by water. And we have another, another project in the pipeline that is, is coming to one of the western coasts of Norway next year, and then I hope to see it in Oslo, I think they say like 2022. Uh, this, is a, a, this is a project called um, Urban Water Shuttle. The concept is that it's zero emitting autonomous ferries that goes in high speed and where you can think of it in the same way that you do like with the metros or trams or buses, it just offloads and unloads people like pew, pew, pew. And for like an ocean city like Mumbai, you have this long stretch. You could basically just plug in, jump on and off, and still get uh, a lot of distance covered very quickly. We also have for the, for the bigger transportation mode, um, there is a big project, uh, project that has got a lot of international attention uh, from all over, I mean, New York Times or Forbes or whatever. Um, we, are, we, we had established last year the world's first autonomous shipping company, and they are currently building uh, the first cargo ship that is both, it's, uh, it has zero emissions, it doesn't use uh, ballast water to keep the balance. You don't risk uh, getting invasive species, organisms from one place to another, so you protect the ecosystem in, in the ocean better. Uh, and it can be, when the regulations are in place, it can also be uh, running without a lot of crew. And then we also actually use technology and clean energy to fix the problem with trash in the fjords. And I, I just spent some time this morning on a beach cleaning um, uh, session with uh, Afril Shah. Um, and we talked about this huge problem that I think everybody's getting more aware of with the fact that when we mess up the planet and we put plastics everywhere, it ends up here in our tonics. Uh, and, and in Oslo, we, we're currently doing a project where we actually use electric drones to identify the garbage that is no longer on the beach, but that has actually just ended up sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And, and then we use it for uh, removing this trash, both kind of uh, chartering it and removing it. And, uh, and the company behind this is actually a startup company that is now working with some of the biggest companies in Norway, and uh, the female founder behind it, she was invited by Richard Branson to spend two weeks on his island uh, last fall. So, what we basically have seen from Norway, you guys, or the, the previous panel talked about China as like a big threat. We think more of from the different side. We're kind of the David and Goliath. We're kind of a small, country, but with a lot of small, radical new projects in the pipeline. So we see a really good opportunity to be a test bed, where you can test out solutions that could have huge impact when it reaches like bigger cities and societies. So we basically do a lot of work now in Oslo, from both on land uh, and in the ocean, to really propel the function to be a test arena for new, innovative, sustainable, clean solutions for the rest of the world. And then we invite the rest of the world to join us in partnerships where uh, we can accommodate uh, entrepreneurs and companies and experts coming in from countries such as India and then developing new radical ideas and projects together with us.
and then you can test it out in small scale and bring it out to the big scale. Um, before rounding off, I also wanted to, to, to share with you a little bit of how we work now to get the business community engaged in sustainable innovation focus. So this year, as we are the European Green Capital, uh, we have set up a business ambassador program where we are now, uh, we have appointed a number of top executive ambassadors and we're sharing their cases on how they push sustainable growth and how they create new business opportunities based on the problems they're facing. We have also set off a mentoring program where we link top executive directors from, from big companies with young entrepreneurs who work on the same fields. So for instance, if you are a player in the real estate sector, you are uh, paired up with a young entrepreneur working on new problem solving for the real estate sector. And then uh, six, seven times during this coming year, they will also be meeting not only their the people from their own industry, but they will also be meeting people from the other five industries together so that we help you know, create an arena where we crash silos and we look at sustainable innovation across industries. Because we know that now we're in a, we're in a point of time in our society when, when we need to really uh, go from, from kind of industry per industry thinking to find the solution that combines like energy, mobility, construction, etc. Uh, and we have, which I'm, uh, I'm thinking that this would be so cool to get also more international uh, partnerships on. Um, we also have created four challenges for the business uh, community that they can take during this year, where they can move from uh, emission-free transportation of goods and service, or they can move investments from black to green, or they can, um, or they can sign up for cutting unnecessary single-use plastic in their operations. So, um, before opening up the floor for discussions, I just wanted to invite you all in to look at how you think we could uh, tie uh, closer cooperations between the Norwegian and uh, Indian business communities. We also have a similar network on family businesses in Norway that are really active and spanning across a lot of different sectors. Um, but I think there are, uh, we are, uh, we're actually working on an initiative now uh, together with uh, Sanjam, uh, which not only comprises of like ocean, uh, but where we are, um, working now on, on setting up a more kind of formal city-to-city -city cooperation between Mumbai and uh, Oslo. That spans across sustainability, tech, entrepreneurs, diversity, and the ocean space. So, um, I also know that we have some, some big needs in, in Norway. We have a lack of really good tech competence. So we really also want to see more partnership uh, on that area, um, and I think that um, uh, we have uh, we have some huge opportunities uh, to look at kind of smart urban uh, bridging um, land to sea based projects in a cooperation. So I think that was it from my side, um, and feel free to ask questions. Anyone need some mic, maybe? Do you have like a handheld mic that can be? I'm actually loud enough. You're loud enough, okay. <laughs> ah, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Very exciting work that you guys are doing back there. Uh, I come from the petro petrochemical space, uh, yeah. plastics largely, right? So what I'm interested to know is, is there some work which is going on back in Norway where you guys have figured out uh, how things have to be done on the recycling and the sustainability and we can bring that model back into uh, India and because I'm looking at expanding my business. Yep. We are not in the recycling space yet, but we are looking at seeing what, what is it that we can do. 
So mm. if there's anything I think we can connect, yeah? That'd be cool. Let's talk after. Or do you want like specific input? No, no, no? Yeah. not specific, but just wanted to know if you are in for that. Good. Cool. Yes. Oh, let's pass it onwards. <laughs> You spoke about biofuel, but is it so available in so much in abundance or can it be made so much that it is possible that every, every country can use it? Well, I, I personally think that biofuel is just kind of a, a one step on the way towards uh, completely sustainable renewable energy. But I think at least that uh, it's really worthwhile looking into the biofuel that we currently don't use for anything, whether it's the stuff that ends up in our toilets or our food waste. It's actually a lot of energy that is now, in most countries, just being wasted. So I don't think it will kind of, I don't think it will be the solution, but I think it will be part of the solution for a kind of a, a period where we are transitioning from like oil and gas and the petrol based energy and coal over to the renewable parts. And I mean, it's just, it's a, an unused resource. So using those to create energy makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for taking up the questions. I think the only way to go ahead for any business or country is to go green. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. May I now request Ms. Sanjum Gupta to uh, come on stage and felicitate Ms. Burgit. There. There. Could I request Dr. Tulsi to please join us on stage? Let's hear it for her, please. Thank you. Thank you. So we step into another break and reconvene at six. But you know what is on the other side of the break, right? We all know who our chief guest is. And we also know that when people come from a film fraternity, they like to see a house full. So let's give him a house full at 6 o'clock. I'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>